thank you all for coming and taking time out of your work and life. I know how much uh, that means, uh, be you all being New Yorkers or work being here for work and time. So it's, we are truly, truly honored and our entire team uh, of the Theatre Without Borders and on the move, we are really uh, uh, stunned uh, of the response um, of, uh, that we got. We now have a, a lineup of speakers. Um, it is, of course, um, not fair to ask any one of these uh, great workers to just give their entire history in five minutes. Um, so this is supposed to be an inspiration, so you know a little bit more, and then you look up their work or talk to them in person. That's why this gathering is here. We have a timekeeper here, and uh, this is Bella, and she will have five minutes, four minutes, three, like in the TV shows. We don't have the music at the end, but close to, so I apologize up front if, to any speaker um, if it is over time. But again, um, now we are going to hear from uh, one of the world's best uh, practitioners and institutions and they will tell us about their experience, how their work started, what they're doing now, what they are thinking about and give us some examples. And they are from around the world and we are truly uh, uh, thankful that people really came, traveled in from Africa, Asia and from Europe for this conference to speak for you for five minutes and uh, <laughs> to also be part of a larger network. And again, please talk to them, approach them, look up their work, and maybe there's something inspiring for you or maybe some of what you will say will inspire um, others. The world, as we know, is so closely connected and globally connected. And uh, this is also celebrating the work and, uh, and the art, the role it plays. So I would like to uh, start uh, Olga Garay. Um, to come uh, up first and speak about uh, the United States. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank um, you for inviting me to this launch of the Cultural Mobility Funding Guide for the USA. I especially want to thank Frank Hensler and Roberta uh, Levitao. And I haven't met uh, Marie Lusser yet, but of course, this has been a labor of love on her part as well. I'm Olga Garay English. Uh, I'm an arts administrator and consultant, and I have been engaged in international cultural exchange for 30 years now. Um, I'm a strong advocate of international engagement, and um, Frank has asked me to present this brief snapshot of the status of cultural mobility for artists and arts administrators and professionals in the United States, our challenges and our opportunities. So let me provide some context, I think. Um, we're a very large country. As of December 29th of last year, the US had a total resident population of more than 300 million people. Um, this is the third most populous country in the world. And the United States Census um, categorizes the people who live in the United States using um, the categories of white American, Native American or Alaskan Native, Asian American, African American, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islanders. There's also a category for people of mixed race. In addition, um, you can say whether you're Hispanic or Latino, and that's an ethnicity versus a race. And if you count Hispanics and Latinos in the United States, we are the largest, we, because I'm from Cuba originally, are the largest um, minority group in the nation. Our country was founded by immigrants and continues to be a strong magnet for the people from all over the world. This is a, a basic information of how this country's uh, major ancestries shapes up. It doesn't really tell a very strong story because it lumps together groups um, such as people of other parts of Latin America are not even really listed here. Um, but you'd think that because of this 
very diverse country uh, and the people who make up this country, we would be really very active in promoting international cultural exchange. <laughs> And you would be wrong. No. Um, <laughs> um, so um, it was actually very much of a challenge preparing this this presentation because when you Google uh, grants for international cultural arts exchange, you get practically nothing. So um, I, I really had to do a lot of research for this. The National Endowment for the Arts um, asserts that it's very difficult comparing how our system works to um, other countries because we have such a diverse um, funding variety. We have, of course, federal grants. We have national and local grants. We have a strong philanthropic sector. But the closest they found was to European uh, countries. And if you'll see at the very bottom of per capita spending, the National Endowment for the Arts gives 47 cents uh, per person per year to the arts in this country. Um, Though the U.S. has a robust philanthropic sector, um, according to grant makers in the arts and the Foundation Center who do research on arts giving every year, only 153 million, that is less than 1% of the funding that was given to the arts, 2.3 billion, was given to international um, projects. So what does that mean? To me that means that we have to take personal and institutional responsibility for getting this work done because at the end of the day what tends to happen is that artists are self-funding to do this kind of work and it really puts a huge burden on our artists. Um, so ooh. can you go back? Yeah. Actually, yeah. Where just, are you at? Here? Uh, yeah, the next one. The next one? Okay, so the next one. Shit. Can you help me? It's not going to. Where do you want to be? The next. There's a slight delay. You just got to press it once, and then it'll go. Just press it once. Press it again. It'll go. Anyway, so I, just not to take up too much time, I want to give you two examples because one of the things that they asked us to do was to give you examples of work that we've done. And, and personally, um, when I got to the, uh, to the Los Angeles um, Department of Cultural Affairs where I was executive director for six and a half years, I created this program which is called Cultural Exchange International. And I did so um, as an attempt to address the fact that artists in our community were not getting support to do international residencies and arts organizations in our community were not given um, support to bring people, artists from other parts of the world to Los Angeles. So this program, which for every dollar we invested, we raised two dollars with the help of many people who are in the room, the Dutch Cultural Services, the British Council, French Cultural Services, Culture Ireland, Sakatar Foundation in Brazil, um, the uh, Pernati Art Center in Indonesia. Um, we put together a, a bunch of money that gave small grants, $5,000 to $25,000 grants for LA-based artists to go abroad and for artists from abroad to come to LA. So we were both outgoing and incoming mobility grants. I, I say this and I'm not telling the last guy who spoke to put it in the new guide because now there's a new administration in Los Angeles and this uh, program was killed. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk about institutional responsibility. And basically, this is a new program which I'm working on that the California Institute of the Arts is um, launched uh, very recently. Uh, for more than 40 years, CalArts has been working to train artists and arts professionals. And they realize that this country is really rapidly turning into a very Latino country. Um, 
We have about 50 million Latinos in this country right now, and that makes us the third largest Latin American, quote, country in the world. Only after Brazil and Mexico does any other country have more um, people from Latin America and the US. So finally, in conclusion, I want to just personally applaud the, uh, all the organizers of this Cultural Mobility Symposium and the creators of the Cultural Mobility Funding Guide for the USA, uh, for they have really taken both personal and institutional responsibility to get this vital information out to our artists and arts professionals. And I want to just say that I want to recommit my own efforts to making this kind of or visible, possible, fundable, and really part of the DNA of how artists can get their work done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olga. Now we have also a very special guest. We have now with us uh, Francois Rivasso, and he is the deputy head of the delegation of the European Union to the United States of America. Good morning. It's impressive to see all these people. It's a great day for the art mobility, cultural mobility. Representing Europe and its 520 million citizens, it should be a great day for us. It's also, I have to say, a day of mourning. You may not be all aware, but uh, this morning in Paris, uh, artists have proven once again that uh, they are between those who give their life to defend their freedom of expression, their freedom of uh, communicating with others. This barbaric attack against Charlie Hebdo, who killed all the direction of Charlie Hebdo, and many uh, renowned French uh, artists, comics author, uh, tells us once again that the values of enlightenment that we share between Europe and the United States are still valid and uh, worthy to be defended. And you are here the vivid testimony of it. I propose 30 seconds, not more because I have only five minutes, 30 seconds of silence in the honor of Charlie Hebdo. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, here with you for the first time because it's only last year that the European Union has decided that some money had to be invested in uh, promoting the European culture abroad. What's the European culture? Uh, <laughs> I have tried to uh, work on it. I've made a number of interventions about it. Uh, but basically, I think there's not a unique definition of it. Uh, that's, the defini that's the culture of member states, plus maybe what we have all in common, uh, which is basically seen from the United States uh, Enlightenment, precisely. Uh, but uh, the important thing for you is that we are willing to, to, to try to develop uh, our contribution to cultural mobility. And uh, we do that without uh, direct funding as a delegation. The funding is still ba Brussels-based. Uh, we hope that it will, uh, uh, that uh, Brussels will take into account the efforts of a day like this. Uh, this I say that for on the move in particular because it's very important. Uh, we, we are here to try to develop this action. So we need you. We are a newborn uh, uh, entity. We have uh, two, two branches. First, we coordinate the action of the 28 member states in the United States in cultural affairs. So we are trying to provide them an extra layer of uh, uh, help and subsidies. Uh, this will start progressively. And for that, we have the uh, uh, European cultural attaché, Constance Whiteside, who is here. And then we, we have no special funding scheme, as I said. So uh, US-like, we try to develop a US funding scheme, uh, which is to um, encourage strong level creation of a foundation. So we are very happy to uh, uh, introduce also to you uh, Kimberly Heverinkeven, who is the new director of this newborn, three months old, uh, European American Cultural Foundation. It's still based in Washington, it's still a newborn, so you will just see uh, her uh, website. We shall just use two minutes uh, video to, to introduce it. They will stay with you all the day, please contact them. 
uh, European Cultural Foundation is still uh, already managing uh, some programs, Washington-based, between them the Your Kid Festival, which is the biggest European artistic uh, kid festival outside of Europe, and the European Open uh, Day, uh, which is the biggest European cultural uh, foundation with uh, 100,000 visitors in Washington. Uh, that's uh, just a start. We need artists to fill our advisory boards. Uh, we need specialists to, to fill our funding boards. Uh, so uh, I stop here because of time and I just ask uh, maybe you to, to present the Cultural Foundation now. Yeah. I'm going to have to look at it like this. It won't play in full screen. It isn't just a question, it's also the answer to something essential, something fundamental about human existence and expression. Culture can change minds, culture can change hearts, culture can change perspectives, and that's what makes culture such a powerful medium for global understanding. This is the philosophy at the core of the newly created European American Cultural Foundation, a US 501c3 nonprofit founded in 2013 to strengthen cultural bonds and collaboration between the European Union and the United States. Programs of the EACF, presented in conjunction with the delegation of the European Union to the United States and its 28 member states, not only reinforce this relationship, they bring it vividly to life through performing arts festivals, special events, lectures, and other forms of cultural cooperation and exchange. What can culture do? Culture can bring hundreds of free, high-quality, and imaginative performances to children and their parents. Inaugurated in 2008, Kids Euro Festival is the largest children's performing arts festival of its kind in the United States, truly a trip to Europe with no passport required. Each of the 28 European Union member states annually participate, sending to DC accomplished EU performing artists for children to present more than 150 free events in schools, theaters, libraries, and even hospitals, all in collaboration with American organizations. What can culture do? Culture can vividly demonstrate the EU motto, unity and diversity, during the European Month of Culture. The authentic cultural vibrancy of all 28 EU member states combines in an energetic tapestry, with each day of May offering at least one or more art exhibit, dance performance, film screening, lecture, or conference, almost 100 in all, at venues all over Washington. It's a fitting and accessible celebration of the month during which the EU was founded and of Washington's own International Cultural Awareness Month. What can culture do? Culture can make the abstract concrete with the welcoming hospitality of EU Open House Day. On EU Open House Day, each of the European Union's 28 member states and the EU delegation open their embassy or the residence of their ambassador to the public. Visitors can taste, talk, and tour, taste native dishes, talk to embassy officials and their staff, and tour cultural exhibits. It's quite possibly the largest EU outreach program outside of Europe, with over 100,000 visits taking place in just six hours. What can culture do? Culture can show us that we're not so very different after all, through Euronight, an evening of cultural sharing. On Euronight, the EU member states gather together, often dressed in native costume, to offer visitors food and drink, inviting travel brochures, and to be entertained by a slate of on-stage European artists. It's one of Washington's most popular special events, and one of its most diverse. Euronight is a one-night chance to tour Europe, and an average of 1,500 make the journey each year. What can culture do? Culture can be a rich topic and resource for exchange, with programs such as Conversations in Culture and EU Rendezvous. By inviting the public to learn more about the culture and policy of the European Union, through concerts, lectures, and forums hosted at the delegation's Washington headquarters, the door is truly open to the creation of a cultural dialogue that can have a very real role and impact in the shared cultural futures of the EU and the United States. There's a theme here, and that theme is connections, continent to continent, country to country, person to person. This is the mission of the European American Cultural Foundation. <laughs> And needless to say, we have some experience in visa also because of that. Thank you very much. And um, now I would like to ask uh, Yumi to come back. 
and uh, speak about uh, the international relations and the career arts management. USB somewhere? We don't have it on here. I already copied it. And maybe it's not there anymore, I don't know why. Do you have it on a USB? Do you want to get it? One second, folks. This is what teching 15 slideshows and a coffee break from all around the world looks like. sure you're all set. Nope. Can you copy it in the... I don't think that'll change anything. And what is it? doesn't work. Yeah. I think you're just going to have to improvise. Yeah, it's, an, it's not a, the document doesn't open up. I oh, really? I already yeah. tried checking it before. It doesn't open up. Are you sure this is the one here? It's not another one of these? Uh, I have my laptop. Can you use it? No? I don't know. I think you're just going to have to, to talk because this is only a limited amount of time. So we uh, might just uh, skip ahead and um, welcome Octavio Abiales Tobon and um, welcome. Do you have anything? No. Uh, good morning. Uh, voy a usar la vieja tecnología de comunicarme con palabras. Like he said he's going to use the old technology of communicating with words. Uh, I have a lot of trouble with pronunciation in English, and it's my son, <laughs> Camilo, <laughs> translate for me. Uh, five minutes, Frank. <laughs> uh, la premisa de la que partimos cuando abordamos nuestro trabajo es construir un espacio cultural común en Iberoamérica. Like the premise that we work on is to build a common cultural space in Latin America and Iberoamérica. Entendiendo por Iberoamérica, España y Portugal. Eh, a partir de ahí, desde la perspectiva de lo gubernamental, se construyeron los programas Iber, programas que abarcaban iniciativas de sostenibilidad para la movilidad de los artistas en el ámbito iberoamericano. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we built um, like the Iber programs, uh, which focus on the mobility of artists uh, in the Iberoamerican uh, cultural space. Uh, in performing arts, especially. Uh, uh, theater, music and dance. Uh, Iber musicas, Iber escena, and 
other camps, the, the cultural activities. Desde, esa, desde el campo Iber se ha producido un fenómeno muy importante porque con muy poco dinero se ha logrado un gran impacto en toda la comunidad iberoamericana. El eh, ámbito o el, 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 el presupuesto anual es más o menos de un millón de euros. With very little budget, eh, the Iber programs have managed to generate a great impact eh, with its performing arts programs. Eh, en el otro campo, el campo pues, de la iniciativa privada, eh, de, la, de la iniciativa de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, hemos conseguido consolidar algunas redes que precisamente han propiciado la circulación de centenares de artistas por eh, Latinoamérica y el Caribe. But on the other hand, there are other programs in the private sector um, which have uh, allowed for cultural mobility and for artists to, to perform in a lot of countries in Latin America and Iberoamérica. Eh, esas redes llevan más o menos eh, 20 de, a 25 años de acción. And those networks have been working for 20 or 25 years. Actualmente hay un impacto político de interacción entre lo público y lo privado en Sudamérica especialmente. Especially in South America there has been a lot of cooperation between the private private and the public se uh, sectors. So they have been working together um, for the purposes that they are uh, working on. Y en particular se han propiciado mercados culturales para servir de plataforma a la circulación de los artistas. And one of the most important uh, events that we use are the music markets, uh, which allow for the mobility of artists uh, throughout Latin America and the world. Es, destaco especialmente Mixur, el mercado de las industrias culturales de Sudamérica que tuvo una primera edición en Mar del Plata, Argentina. The most important one of them is Mixur, which had its first edition in Mar del Plata, Argentina, and it will be taking place uh, periodically. El año próximo, es decir, en el año 2016, la sede será Bogotá, Colombia. The next, next year, in 2016, the... Uh, the city that will host it will be Bogotá in Colombia. Eh, será en el mes de agosto y abarcará la organización de los 12 países miembros de UNASUR, los 10 países continentales más Guaya Guyana y Surinam. Uh, it will take place in August and it will uh, the, the UNASUR countries will be there participating. Y Espero que todos ustedes puedan asistir a, a este mercado que es sin duda el más relevante de la escena continental y latinoamericana. We hope you, uh, all of you can come to the, this market, which is definitely the most important music market in Latin America. Eh, en el campo teatral específicamente tenemos eh, en Colombia y en Latinoamérica apoyo muy importante desde el, eh, desde el campo eh, de las industrias creativas, considerando esto desde la perspectiva de las industrias creativas. Les doy las gracias, cumplo con mis cinco minutos rigurosamente, y, <ríe> para evitar que mi colega esté... <ríe> Muchas gracias. En el sector sector, especialmente, ha habido mucho apoyo, And uh, he wants to thank each one of you. To thank you, bye. So um, now I would like to introduce a playwright uh, and the executive director of African Arts Institute from uh, South Africa, who flew in for us, uh, Mike Van Graan. Thank you.
UNESCO's 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions advocates preferential access to global North markets for creative goods from and for increased collaboration and exchange with the Global South. I was just told right now that this is not yours. Uh, back to my five minutes. <laughs> With Africa's share of the global creative economy at less than 1%, this convention is potentially catalytic for African artists as it encourages their greater mobility and that of their creative goods. Yet while it is relatively inexpensive to export books, DVDs, and CDs, it is more challenging to tour performing arts companies that require flights, accommodation, fees per diems, and of course, visas. Although two-thirds of Africa's 54 countries have signed up to the convention, few of these see the economic, political, social, or human development value of supporting the mobility of the artists or the creative industries generally, especially when mining and telecommunications are driving growth of 4 to 11% for most African countries anyway. With 50% of Africans living below the poverty line of $2 per day, it is unlikely that there are markets in most countries to support the touring of African performing artists, so that most festivals and other stages on the continent are dependent on international funding to survive. It is against this background that Arterial Network emerged in 2007, a civil society network of artists, creative practitioners, and cultural activists. Rather than depend on governments to support the sector, Arterial Network's rationale is to build partnerships between creative practitioners on the continent and to work with regional and international agencies to, in pursuit of their agenda, including the mobility of African artists. There are four key challenges related to the mobility of African artists. First, rising national chauvinism and anti-immigration parties linked in part to economic recession in the global north limit the mobility of African artists who struggle to obtain visas. Secondly, in a post-9-11 world, security in the global north trumps the need for cultural diversity. Those regarded as other or as potential security threats encounter travel restrictions. Ignorance is a third factor so that when there's an outbreak of a life-threatening disease in one part of Africa, all Africans may be deemed undesirable. Finally, with the lack of political will from African governments, cultural mobility dependent on international funding is subject to global north recessionary conditions and shifting donor priorities. So it was that Art Moves Africa and African Mobility Fund was unable to operate for more than a year before receiving European donor funding. Despite these challenges, African artists travel globally tour the world and are engaged in cultural exchanges and collaborations. But because these are often funded mostly by Global North resources, inherent in such international exchanges are unspoken but real and unequal power relations manifested in a range of ways, including aesthetic choices. In closing, the African Arts Institute, AFI, which once coordinated Arterial Network and both are independent entities now, seeks in a modest way to contribute to cultural mobility and the building of regional markets as advocated by the 2005 UNESCO Convention. On a monthly basis, we screen movies made by African filmmakers, host dance parties featuring African music, and invite theater makers, writers, and filmmakers to participate in South African festivals to project them into local and international markets. Ultimately, though, Cultural mobility has to be engaged with through advocacy, through networking, and resource mobilization. Accordingly, we are currently in the process of helping to facilitate a global south network of creative practitioners from Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Arab world, Caribbean, and Pacific to assert a policy agenda from within these areas to facilitate south-south cultural exchange and to mobilize greater resources from within these regions. This is a photograph of the team that attended the preparatory meeting in Cape Town, including people from the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture, the Asia European Foundation, and Arterial Network. 
It is imperative that in addressing cultural mobility issues, that structural inequalities that impact on mobility are addressed at the same time. Thank you. Um, and now uh, it is my great uh, pleasure and honor um, to introduce Fritzi Brown, uh, the beloved executive director of CEC ArtsLink. Thank you. Hello. Shall I wait? Yeah, is this you? That's me. Do you have it? This, this is all good for you? I guess so. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Roberta, Frank, and Murray for, and their staffs, their hardworking staffs, uh, for setting up this important symposium and for inviting me. Um, and for also inviting this wide international uh, range of participants. I am Fritzi Brown. I direct CEC ArtsLink, uh, which is located here in New York. Uh, it's an organization that's been active. How do I commence the show? Oh, I'm not sure what I've got here. Okay. Um, we've been active since uh, the Cold War, but in 1992, we focused on arts exchange and currently support exchanges with three countries uh, in Eastern, um, 37 countries, I beg your pardon, in Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the, though the Cold War has long passed, we believe it benefits everyone when artists have access to work internationally. We are not a foundation. We do not have an endowment, and each year we must raise our small budget, a million dollars, uh, from zero. This money comes from private foundations, um, private individuals, and a small amount is coming from, and this will be, 2015 will be the last year of National Endowment for the Arts funding. Uh, any petitioning or advocating anyone wants to do to turn that around would be greatly appreciated. Uh, to achieve our program, to achieve our uh, mission, uh, we have a number of projects, uh, both East uh, and West cultural exchanges. Um, probably the best known are our ArtsLink Awards, and it's comprised of three interconnected areas. I feel like a grease monkey of practicality after your really enlightened speech. Thank you. Um, we have the residencies, which funds U.S. arts organizations uh, to host uh, visiting fellows from any of the 37 eligible countries for five-week professional stays. It's for artists and arts managers of all disciplines, though we alternate disciplines each year. Uh, we cover international travel costs associated with their visits and underwrite a three-day, uh, two three-day stays in New York City before sending them off on their residencies throughout the United States. Um, fellows apply online and are selected by peer panel review um, here in New York of uh, professionals, uh, professionals, um, in the US. Uh, we have so far hosted 499 fellows in the US, and they've been uh, taken care of and included into the matrix of 276 arts organizations throughout uh, 35 US states. We have reciprocally uh, ArtsLink projects, which uh, US artists apply uh, to participate in projects in any of the eligible countries. Um, uh, since its inception, we have put $2 million to that aim, and I believe there are uh, recipients of that, those grants among the audience today. 
Um, we also have a small project, a very small pool of money for independent projects. It was created as a follow-on pool for ArtsLink residents for return projects in the U.S. And we funded ooh, about a half a million dollars in those. We're a very small organization. We have only three people in our New York office. We have a small uh, office in St. Petersburg, Russia, and that helps us very much in uh, facilitating uh, facilitating projects in Central, Central Asia. And we will be conducting, with the support of the State Department, a uh, two-year music education um, uh, enterprise with uh, musicians in Central Asia. So our website is www.cecartslink.org. And my door is always open. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, uh, Fritzi. And now it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, announce the uh, new program coordinator for the Sundance Institute Theatre Program, a great program, Ivan Idibiri. And uh, thank you. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ivani Devery, and I'm the new producing coordinator at the Sundance Institute Theater Program. And I work with artistic director Philip Himberg and producing director Christopher Hitma, who unfortunately cannot be here as they are attending a swearing-in ceremony for the new ambassador for New Zealand to the United States, who is a friend and cultural ally of theirs. So Sundance Institute um, was founded in 1981 by actor and director Robert Redford, whose mission was to support and develop new works by inspiring new and independent artists. And so cu currently Sundance provides support for artists in the fields of film, theater, film composing, and digital media. So Sundance is spread between three major cities. We're in Park City in Utah, where our film festival is held. We're in Los Angeles, California, and we are here in New York City, which is where our theater program is. Today, Sundance employs about 150 people in total, and we, in, in the entirety of the institute, we end up supporting about 24 regional labs and workshops, and we support and mentor about 350 artists each year. Upcoming for Sundance is our world-renowned film festival, which happens at the end of January in Park City, Utah. Now, specifically for the theater program, our theater program currently has five full-time staff members, and we support six annual labs and retreats around, around the United States and internationally. Our focus is on new play development, in which we give artists the time and the space to develop their new works, and to excavate and take risks while they're, develop, while they're developing whatever they see fit to develop. And, and, and with that, we have to make it known that we do not produce nor do we present these new works. We only support the very, very important process in which it takes for these artists to get where they need to get to. So each year we end up supporting 11 new plays and musicals and serve more than 175 artists during this process. So actors, dramaturgs, stage managers, directors, composers, everyone in between for the creative process. We hold our labs in Utah, Wyoming, Massachusetts, the Hamptons, France, and in East Africa, because it is important that we have a relationship to nature. So none of our labs or workshops occur in major metropolitan cities. Sundance has been focused on branching out internationally, and the last 13, actually 14 years now, the theater program has been involved in deep peer-to-peer -peer intercultural engagement in six East African countries and is now expanding that initiative to the Middle East North Africa region. 
So between th 2002 to 2009, uh, our relationship has grown tremendously. And it began in 2002 when Philip went to visit Uganda with Roberta, and he discovered a playwright named Deborah Asimwe, who eventually became our East Africa specialist in the theater program. And there began a relationship which led to many reciprocal visits between East Africa, East African and American artists. So further along on that, we conducted theater labs and workshops in East Africa and Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. And in turn, our East African alumni have participate, participated and developed works in our theater lab in Utah, and they have had exposure visits in New York. Now looking ahead, we are very proud of our alumni as Deborah, who was our East African specialist, just co-produced the first Kampala International Theater Festival, which will hopefully continue next year. And it was developed in part through Sundance's funding, but it was all through the East African artists getting together and continuing the relationships that they fostered through the Sundance Theater Labs. This is a picture of Deborah. She's beautiful. Here's a picture of uh, a picture at our lab in Manda in Kenya. Here's a staff photo. Christopher and Philip are there hanging out and having fun. And as I mentioned earlier, Sundance Theater program, we're now focusing on the MENA region, specifically Arab language theater. And so both Philip and Christopher have taken several research trips to the area to find local artists with new and interesting work to bring to light internationally and domestically in America. Our Excuse me, our goal is to have a lab in the MENA region by 2016, so next year, yay. And if you have more, if you have any other questions or would like to contact us and check us out, our website is www.sundance.org slash theater. And also feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for that truly uh, inspiring presentation. And now I would like to introduce Miki Hota, who is the Program Director of Arts and Cultural Exchange, the Japan Foundation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Miki Hota, a Program Director at the Japan Foundation, New York. I arrived in New York about one year ago from Tokyo. First, I'd like to thank the Merlin E. Siegel Theater Center for providing me the opportunity to briefly introduce our organization and explain our various funding opportunities. If you took um, this flyer, purple one, at the entrance, please take a look at this. The foundation is Japan's principal agency specializing in the promotion of international cultural exchange between Japan and other countries. It was established in 1972 as a special legal entity supervised by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Our head office, head office is in Tokyo, and there are 22 overseas offices in 21 countries. We have three major fields of activity, as shown here. You may be asking yourselves, what kind of funding opportunities does the Japan Foundation offer? Um, we have main um, three grant programs. Well, actually, I skipped one. Sorry. Oh. Today, I will focus just on arts and cultural exchange, between, uh, which includes performing arts. Our activities are fivefold to initiate and conduct projects, to co organize and co present projects with US performing arts organizations, to administer grant programs for performing artists and presenters, to conduct information exchange in performing arts. Lastly, to conduct international collaborative projects with artists from foreign countries. 
focusing now on our grant programs in performing arts. You may be asking yourselves, uh, what kind of per, uh, funding opportunities does the Japan Foundation offer? We have three main grant programs, Performing Arts Japan North America. We believe that this is the most accessible program for US artists and presenters. I will come back to this later. Japan Foundation New York, or JFNY Grant for Arts and Culture, applicants must be US nonprofit organizations. Applications are accepted on a rolling basis, but must be submitted at least three months before the project starts. This is more flexible than the previously mentioned PAJ program. We ask applicants located west of the Rocky Mountains to contact our LA office for more details. The grant program for dispatching artists and cultural specialists. This is a program administered by Tokyo. Unlike PAJ, applications are submitted by arts groups or individuals based in Japan and are directed to our head office. This grant covers part of the international airfare and freight costs. Now I'd like to come back and talk about PAJ in more detail. This program aims to introduce Japanese performing arts to local US audiences. There are two categories, touring and collaboration. Touring grants support Japanese performing arts at multiple locations in the US and Canada. We work on proposals that bring Japanese artists to locations where there is little or no regular exposure to Japanese performing arts. Collaboration grants, however, support American and Japanese artists so that they may together develop a new work, which fathers appreciation of Japanese culture when presented to American audiences. This program is open to nonprofit organizations in the US and Canada. Grants are made on a cost-sharing basis, and JF can cover up to 50% of the total project costs. The deadline is in autumn annually. To date, PAJ has founded 253 projects. A list of past awardees can be found on our website. For more information, please visit our website. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Miki. And now I would like to introduce Johann Flo, who is the director of the Fresh Arts Collision Europe phase. Hello. Thank you. I might, I might not be able to, to even go through these five minutes because I'm losing my voice. I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, Should I start? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So, um, the Face Network. Uh, oh, great. Big logo, indeed. Um, so FACE is uh, uh, standing for Fresh Arts Coalition Europe. It's a um, young organization um, based in Paris, France, and uh, dedicated to uh, uh, hybrid art form, pluridisciplinary work. It's um, a network um, uh, really focusing on, on hybrid practices and all these um, performances that we have so much difficulties to put in just one box. And I guess many people in the room know what I'm talking talking about. So we cover a lot of different practices, of course, um, the physical theater, visual theater, contemporary puppetry, but also public art, site-specific work, and many other uh, uh, artistic disciplines. 
The um, network gathers uh, 45 members from 21 countries. Most of the um, uh, members are best in Europe, but we have members in the US and Canada and in Australia too. Um, what's interesting in this network is that we gather organizations that have very different profiles. Some are, of course, venue theaters, some are uh, festivals, some are creation centers only, but we have also funders, we have uh, magazines, and the purpose of the network is really to, to gather uh, uh, different profiles and propose them not only to network but really to participate in collaboration and make sure that the collaboration are transversal. So not only to uh, gather a club of festivals uh, or club of artists and make them uh, work together but to design and help and support the, the, the future collaboration that we'll uh, put together in the same room or journalists but also artists and festivals directors and funders. Um, of course, um, I'm just a picture of our, uh, uh, we are based in Carreau du Temple, a brand new venue in, in Paris. Uh, very happy about these premises, to be honest. Um, so, of course, uh, as a network, and, and this is, uh, and, and being an independent network uh, with a very small office and uh, in a very uh, similar situation as uh, On The Moose, with, uh, uh, with whom we're working a lot with, um, the, uh, the key uh, uh, principle is to really uh, increase or get as much as benefit as possible for our members. Um, we want all our activities to be relevant for them, we want them to engage in these activities, we want them to cooperate produce, co-design, co whatever with the, all these uh, all these uh, activities we propose uh, the activities are um, um, a classical it could be seminar it could be workshops uh, we try to push them to encourage them to really connect with arts organizations that are really far from their comfort zone and far from their country or home base so we try to build small bridges or big bridges sometimes with uh, other continents um, in, these, uh, in these multiple and uh, varied activities, I will just focus on one, which is uh, uh, one that is uh, uh, very interesting in terms of international collaboration and in terms of all the mobility opportunities we uh, create or, or the uh, or mobility program we try to reach uh, to implement these projects. Uh, we have an accelerator or incubator. Um, uh, activity and we try to uh, help experiment so taking the risk for our members to design new projects um, as an example at the moment we are try we are experimenting a two-year scheme that took place already in Europe uh, to support residencies for critics and journalists in the framework of uh, contemporary performing arts festivals and we experimenting these formats in uh, Canada and hopefully one day in Australia and uh, we are experimenting this in May in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, one of the next uh, uh, pilot project we are thinking of is called Steamed Out and it's a, 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 an experiment between Europe and Australia to focus on um, all the um, development phase of artistic project and to uh, in include already at the very, very, very beginning of the, the making of new productions, new work, uh, the international dimension. So to make, uh, to give the possibility for artists to uh, have an international experience already very early in the dedication process, in the creation process. Um, not much else. I mean, a lot, a lot more to say, but I guess I could invite you to visit our website. It's fresheurope.org. And uh, we will be here all day. And uh, I have the chance to have a delegation of members with me today and even two board members. So don't hesitate to come and meet us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johan, um, so much. Um, now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Surafel Vondimou, who is currently at the University of Minnesota studying, but from the Addis Abeba University in Africa. You just click there. 
theatrical mobility in Northeast Africa. How do bodies move? I would say that cultural mobility is not given, but mediated by power. When it comes to an African body who has been spoken for by colonial and imperial powers, the rest, classed, gendered and sexualized global relations inform the ways in which this body moves. However, today I would like to talk about possibilities engendered by individuals, groups, and institutions, despite the limitations embedded in their historical relations. It was because of theater that I first went, to, went out of Ethiopia in 1998 to participate in a festival in Cameroon. I acted in the same play in the same year in Kenya. Then I got opportunity to work with Kenyan, Tanzanian, and Ugandan dramaturgs and writers. That cultural mobility was made possible because of the Ethiopian creation of alternative methods for advocacy and East African Theatre Institute, which obtained their funding from Swedish International Development Cooperation. Given those activities heavily depended on and spearheaded by the Northern Visions and monetary aid, they were always already doomed. When the former withdraws, the latter collapse. Yet they presented possibilities for East African performance to know each other, if not to found a community. It became my firm belief that a strong global mobility cannot be built without a vibrant local artistic consciousness and practice. Amid their tensions, the global and local spaces need to meet with mutual understanding and reciprocity being abided by the respective ethical awareness of their own historical and social relations. My organization, as a communication, was founded in that parlance and worked towards awareness creation on the urgency of mobility in Africa, since most of our performance artists were provincial, except the state and some NGO-sponsored bodies whose movements are choreographed by certain kind of politics and economy. Sometimes, individuals and advertent encounters help establish long-standing relationships. The UNESCO ambassador Ali Mahadi Nouri came to Addis, he is here with us, for theatre troops who would participate in his ninth edition of Al Buga Theatre Festival. I introduced him to Ethiopian theatre institutions. When he sent the invitation, none but our organization responded and staged its, place, its play in Umdurman. We widened our connections in the region. Here is Ali Mahdi and other colleagues. Although their formation has its own historicity, African cultural initiatives such as Art Moves Africa, Arterial Network, and African Arts Institute have presented possibilities for us to know each other and move across the continent. Nonetheless, Ethiopian writers and performers have not wider interaction in the global arti artistic fields. Ironically, some African artists would be closer to the north than to the south. Thanks to visionary artists, the Ethiopian chapter of Arterial Network was established recently. Uh, one of the founders, he's with, here with us, uh, um, Munit. With all its limits, one of the organizations which created opportunities for East African artists to work together while at the same time exchanging ideas with their counterparts in the North, particularly in the US, is Sundance East African Theater Institute. We used the spaces catered by Sundance to open up avenues whereby we actively and reflexively invent ourselves. The recent Kampala International Theatre Festival, staged by Ugandan colleagues, is a case in point. All the descendants, all the descendants Ethiopian alumni, collaborating through our respective organizations, are catering a festival under the rubric Crossing Boundaries, Global Humanities, North East African Homes. Grappling with political, economic, and other challenges, we are determined to make the mobility happen in September 24 through 27 in 2015 by inviting performers, intellectuals from Egypt, 
Sudan, South Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, Somalia, Rwanda, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, South Africa, and other countries. You all are invited. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Rafael. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce the Elizabeth Hayes, the Executive Director of the FACE Foundation, the French American Cultural Exchange. Thank you. Just hit this to advance the slides. This one? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. I do want to repeat the thanks that have been expressed to all of the people who worked so hard to put this together. And I'd simply like to uh, single out Frank because we've known one another and talked about this subject for so many years. And he is clearly passionate about his commitment because if you look around the room and we are so numerous, I think that in itself is, is an important statement. So thank you to all of you. I'm so thrilled to be able to meet some new people as well. Uh, let's try that. FACE. Isn't it interesting that there are a few organizations called FACE? And I believe another one connected to Finland. And in fact, we are an American 501c3 based in New York, but everything we do has to do with Franco-American cultural activity. So your connection to Paris is particularly charming. Um, FACE is a 501c3. We have a very special relationship that is a partnership and an official partnership with the cultural services of the French Embassy in the United States. The cultural services, as you probably know, are based here in New York. You probably know that for many years they've been doing absolutely remarkable work. And I think that our partnership uh, allows us to do a number of things that, and that either of the single institutions would not be able to do. In the last 10, 11 years, FACE has grown from an organization, again, in partnership with the Cultural Services, of four grant programs to now 12, and many special projects, which I think people in this room may know about, such as the theater festival called Act French some years ago, Sounds French that preceded it. Everything that we do has to do with living artists, new and recent work, and... Um, one thing I do want to point out as I speak about our relationship with the French government, we, the uh, cultural services obviously is a French government organization. FACE is an American nonprofit, so we have two uh, independent organizations, public and private, working together. I do not think that there are very many other examples. I can't name one. We are so different. We are not. Uh, we are not active as the Goethe Institute Cervantes British Council, and they all do extraordinary work. But the public-private relationship is different. For instance, our status uh, as a nonprofit here in this country allows us to fundraise to take funds in. A government organization obviously is giving funds out when they do, uh, and they do, fortunately, and I think the French are very strong about it. I would like to, you will see the, our areas of activity. We have grant programs. We give our grants to, non, uh, to cultural institutions, to nonprofits, be they in French in France or in this country. So we have contemporary music, jazz, theater, dance, visual arts, several programs in cinema, uh, translation and publication, very special, and also uh, two programs in secondary education and a higher education. Many of those are new in the last 10 years as our collaboration has strengthened and grown. One thing I do like to point out, because it is so important to me, is that, again, the enlightened thinking in, uh, in, in France and of the French government, I'm happy to say, for us in terms of our grant programs, an artist is French if the artist is indeed French or resident of France for five years or more. An artist is American if he or she is American or resident of this country for, uh, officially resident for five years or more. So everything we do is international. Because how can anyone draw the line now? And I think that this breadth uh, in, in perception is something that is also important that strengthens everything that we all do. Just quickly, I pushed the wrong button. Uh, each of our grant programs in the cultural uh, in the cultural funds, because some of the programs work differently. The selection process takes place always uh, with two 
uh, American professionals and two French, because everything we do is Franco-American. And they are, as you see, uh, active professionals in the field, in the country. There's a rotation system. Each person serves for three years. Just very quickly, the list of the current grantees in contemporary music, because you will see for the most part, we're talking about uh, smaller organizations and n uh, new young artists. In some cases, you may notice, for instance, a rather established uh, prestigious institution, which is the New York Philharmonic. That would much more be an example as it would be the rule. Um, this is not to talk about numbers, but just the bottom part shows the expenditures of the Institut Francais, which is, I don't want to say it's the cultural department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France, because that, that would give you the correct image, but it is in fact an independent organization and an NGO. And I think what is remarkable, bravo la France, and if I may say our collaboration, is that the French government really understands and practices cultural diplomacy as something which is real. And I'm very happy that we also have here today a representative of the Ministère de la Culture, because in the past, the Ministry of Culture in France was devoted very much to supporting French artists in France, and they still do, but they are also now uh, very concerned with uh, international activity for French artists. So on our website, which I think was in the first slide, in any case, www.face-foundation.org, a new, a new website address, all of the eligibility criteria, the activity, grantees, artistic committees of our programs are listed. And as we, indeed, this is a day of celebration for us all to be here, it's also a day when we woke up to a great shock about the event that took place in Paris, and we've already observed, thank you, Monsieur Rivasso, 30 seconds of silence, but maybe we can just take one very deep breath and think of what happened this morning and the courage of all of the artists that we work for and we work to promote. Thank you for this opportunity, very special. Thank you, Melo, the best. Now, we uh, have Seba Rahman, who's the uh, Senior Program Officer of the Doris Duke Foundation on the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Frank, for inviting me here. I'm going to take you very quickly through the activities of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, which has several operating foundations um, underneath it. So the mothership is... Uh, hang on while I get this right. This way? Yes. Um, the mothership is the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, um, and uh, it has attached to it three operating foundations, the Doris Duke Farm Foundation, which is in Hillsborough, New Jersey, um, about 27, 20, uh, 800 acres of farmland, which now conducts um, a series of environmental programs that's open to the public and has beautiful trails that um, the public can go and, and uh, ride on, you know, we have um, a set of bicycles and or walk on. The Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art um, and the Newport Restoration Foundation. Under the, the mothership, as I said, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, we have several programs including the arts, um, child well-being, and uh, the environment and the medical research programs. And since um, you would most likely be interested in the arts programs, I should say that we focus on the discipline of contemporary dance, jazz, and theater. These were passions for Doris Duke, our patron. And in particular, um, we uh, fund programs in artistic creation, support for organizations, national sector building. And we have a special initiative that was more recently created called the Doris Duke Performing Artists Awards. These are awards that um, are given to performing arts in these three fields that I just described, jazz, theater, and contemporary dance. And the nominations come from artists' peers in the fields. 
Under child well-being, we have a special initiative which is international facing, um, and that focuses on African health systems. Under the operating foundations, we, um, Duke Farms, as I said, is uh, based in New Jersey and it has a focus on environmental stewardship and habitat restoration and particularly uh, wildlife restoration, rehabilitation and land preservation. And uh, there are several classes for families to educate them about stewardship and, and also for educators. In addition, they conduct research there on conservation, species management and green technology. Technologies. And they have a, an eagle camp set up because there's a particular family of eagles in a very old tree um, that's been hatching babies. And uh, we have an eagle camp that watches their da daily activities. And we can see that in the cafeteria. It's very popular with the public. And um, the other operating foundation is the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. Um, it has two parts to it. Um, Shangri-La, which is based at Doris Duke's seasonal home in Honolulu, Hawaii. It's, um, the house itself is based on Islamic architecture, very beautiful, and it's now a house museum which houses her 2,500-odd collection of museum-quality objects. And it's also a study center um, where, uh, with the university, there's a conservation uh, program. In addition, there's a residency program for artists and scholars year-round, and um, Shangri-La also hosts convenings for uh, like-minded organizations and groups. The Building Bridges program, which is based here in New York, has a national focus, and it has two programs currently. One is the Association of Performing Arts Presenters Managed um, Campus Community Engagement, which targets the millennial population, the campus-based population, and the communities around it, and the in-house managed um, Building Bridges program, which focuses on the performing arts, media, literary arts, more broadly, um, a multi-generational population. And finally, um, there is the Newport Restoration Foundation at Rough Point, which was another of Doris's seasonal homes. And that is now a public museum that displays the Duke family's sizable and important European art collection. If you'd like more information about our activities and programs, you can visit all these many websites at your leisure. Um, thank you for having me here. Now it's uh, our pleasure to welcome Cicely Cook, the Senior Program Officer from the Asian Cultural Council. Thank you. Hi, um, as uh, Frank said, I'm Cecily Cook. I'm the Senior Program Officer at the Asian Cultural Council, which is a foundation that's based here in New York, and we have offices in Tokyo, Taipei, Manila, and Hong Kong. Um, we are a foundation that supports cultural exchange between Asia and the United States in the performing and visual arts, primarily by providing individual fellowship grants to artists and scholars and specialists carrying out work, research, study, and creative work. In addition to support for the artists themselves, we believe it's equally important to support the various infrastructures that en enable them to do their work. For this reason, we also make fellowship grants to arts administrators, festival managers, curators, programmers, technical theater specialists, and exhibition designers. Serving a geographical range that stretches from Afghanistan through Japan and southward to Indonesia, ACC grants support artists and specialists working in the fields of archaeology, architecture, art history, film, crafts, dance, museology, painting and sculpture, and theater. The ACC supports Asians traveling to the US and among the countries of Asia, and Americans carrying out research and projects in Asia. We also make some grants to organizations to support projects of particular significance to Asian American cultural exchange. The ACC was founded in 1963 as the John D. Rockefeller III Fund. 
Mr. Rockefeller believed in the supreme worth of the individual and the power of the arts to inspire mutual understanding between nations. Since its inception, the ACC has supported almost 6,000 individual artists participating in cultural exchange activities between the US and Asia. The ACC has always followed a responsive model, not a prescriptive one. As a consequence, the design of each ACC grant has been as unique as its grantee. The ACC support, devotes special attention to arranging programs tailored specifically to the needs and professional objectives of each grantee, advising them on cultural resources, preparing itineraries, scheduling meetings with arts professionals, professionals arranging act academic affiliations, and encouraging grantees to explore interdisciplinary relationships among the arts in both Asian and American contexts. As a part of our program, we maintain 10 apartments for our grantees in New York City. <laughs> and we partner with artist residency programs such as Residency Unlimited, ISCP, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, and the Triangle Residency Workshop to provide working space for our visual artists. We also partner with residencies outside of New York City, such as the Headland Center for the Arts and the 18th Street Art Center in California. Our grantees in the field of dance often participate in residencies at the American Dance Festival or the Bates Dance Festival. We organize field trips and gatherings at our office to give our grantees the chance to get to know each other. <laughs> and grantees forge bonds and act as, act as, as a support network for each other. In 2013, the ACC celebrated its 50th anniversary and we're looking forward to the next 50 years of supporting cultural exchange between the Asia and US. And I will conclude, um, I hope under five minutes, um, uh, by, uh, with a quote from a former grantee, um, a visual artist from Taipei who sent me an email yesterday and he said, and uh, Wu Chitsang, and he said, the ACC Fellowship is definitely not an interruption in our lives as artists. It's like opening a window for us to survey the world and also like a mirror to reflect and discover ourselves again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cicely. And now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Manas Fancy, the Executive Director of Arte East. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Roberta, Marie, Camille, everybody who's organized this. Um, I have a very, very plain, very sad, aesthetically unimpressive, um, my friend. Uh, thank you. Uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'm gonna just talk you guys through and pretend that it's not really there, thank you. So um, I took over RT East in 2013, almost two years ago, and inherited this wonderful arts organization that had spent um, over 10 years broadening US exposure to an appreciation of contemporary MENA arts and culture. And, um, this meant, you know, hundreds of artists, uh, film programs, artist talks, um, an incredibly rich history. And out of that had emerged a kind of informal function to facilitate a lot of the kind of um, aspects of cultural mobility that were not attended to by anybody else. And so since uh, 2013, we've kind of shifted and we'll be making a kind of more public statement about this very shortly. But last year we had a conference uh, with the Ford Foundation, which many of you were at, which allowed us to really uh, look very closely at how, what kind of challenges and opportunities really lie for cultural partnership and cultural engagement um, and expanding exchange between the US and the Middle East and North Africa. 
It's an incredibly diverse and wide geographical space that my institution deals with. Um, there are specific issues and uh, flare-ups from war and refugees and other such problems that make this work of supporting artists and their uh, work all the more important. Um, so moving forward, um, RTEs is going to be really a US-based facilitator for expanded cultural mobility for both individual artists and arts organizations from the MENA region in the US, as well as uh, an institution that promotes and uh, supports um, expanded engagement with the philanthropic community. As Olga pointed out, this is an area that we really um, need to continue um, having a conversation about. Um, in our world today, um, we are, what is my time? I'm not even looking at you, thank you. Um, okay, um, in our world today, we are in an interconnected, global, cosmopolitan, technology-driven, high-speed exchange kind of space. And how do we make sure that the ideas are going back and forth? And as Mike pointed out, like what are the ideas that are coming this way? Who is curating what um, arts and what uh, voices and what messages are coming from those places. So Arte East looks at um, a con uh, bringing a, a modern Arab voice out. And that's one that I, I really believe that the artists should speak for themselves. So the cultural mobility, literally the travel, is a key part of that. Um, how they experience life in this very uh, tumultuous but also really exciting moment across the Middle East and North Africa is really important for American audiences, American publics, and the American creative community to be more aware of and in dialogue with in whatever means. Um, so. Um, Essentially, our vision is that we have this thriving and sustainable arts sector in the Middle East and North Africa through this expanded international arts exchange and engagement with a wider uh, range of partners in the cultural and philanthropic community in the US. Um, oh, look, I forgot about this thing. Um, and um, we really address the main challenges through our work, and these challenges is uh, or access to information, um, how information, I've been creating a kind of guide as well to the kind of funding access that is available and it doesn't exist in a proper written down form and I think it's really exciting that you're starting to do that and I'd love to contribute because it's all been very informal and word of mouth. There, uh, there isn't uh, an, a full-fledged arts infrastructure to support these artists and uh, there aren't schools, there aren't, oh, no, I'm sorry, I keep wanting to talk to you directly. Now I understand the reason. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I talk to myself more than I talk to you. Um, all right, so uh, these are the issues that we are most concerned about, how to develop the infrastructure by bringing uh, Middle East artists and art practitioners and administrators um, out here to create m more um, opportunities that they can bring back to their communities. Thank you. So now we have a, uh, a, a last addition to our program, and we have Laura Siri from the Fulbright, the Great Fulbright Institution. Thank you. Wow. I'm just going to go straight to the website. We can do that. You Hello. Wanna, you want to go right to the website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you go to the right. website. Perfect. Um, my very limited theater training tells me to speak slowly and from my diaphragm, but uh, 
my timekeeper has, has other plans here. Um, my name is Laura Seary. I'm a senior program officer at the Fulbright program. Um, and if I had 30 seconds to tell you about Fulbright, what I would want to get across to this room is Fulbright is for artists. Um, I want to take you directly to our website because I think that some people get confused by the terminology that we use um, because we use terms like student and scholar, which while those certainly are encompassing to some folks, I don't think it says artists in, in kind of as bright, bold letters as I would, I was, I would, I would like it to. Um, the Fulbright program was started in this country after the Second World War as a uh, response to what we needed to do with uh, the surplus from wartime spending um, and is designed as a bi-national uh, collaboration between people to uh, enhance mutual understanding and peace, which I think is a pretty powerful statement. Um, it is still funded by Congress through appropriations to the State Department um, and, and ad administered uh, through the Institute of International Education, which is where I come in. Um, we send about 3,000 U.S. citizens abroad and bring close to 5,000 foreign nationals to the U.S. on an annual basis. Um, I'm going to speak mostly today about the opportunities for U.S. citizens and touch very, very quickly at the end about how to utilize the foreign uh, artists who are here in this country for your various organizations. Um, the first page I have pulled up is the U.S. student program. I want you to think about this as essentially a emerging artists category for our intents and purposes. Um, there are, oh, we, we send st students or artists to about 140 different countries. Um, the requirement for this program is a BA, but there is a very specific caveat that says, or four to five years of professional artistic training. So if an artist has not gone through a traditional collegiate setting, they are eligible to apply. Um, there are two types of grants which our artists uh, traditionally apply for, and those are study or research, but let's think about it as an independent project for the sake of this, uh, thank you, for the sake of this talk. Um, the study grants are to pursue higher education abroad, um, to earn a master's degree at, in a foreign country. Fulbright will cover your travel, your living expenses, and with, in collaboration with the host government, your tuition for a, at a foreign institution. So that's a good thing to know about. Um, the, the research component is a little bit vaguer. You get to propose to us what you want to do with your time abroad. Um, and I hope that our Fulbright scholars from the US will take advantage of the wonderful opportunities presented by some of our uh, partners abroad. Um, these grants are designed for people who are kind of in the five to eight year range out from, from college starting right um, or, or their professional training, but there is no age limit. So if you think of yourself as an emerging artist, this might be a good, a good field for you. And having an MFA does not rule you out from applying for this. Um, the second program I want to talk about is what we call the Scholars Program, but I want us to think about it as the Established Artists Program. Um, these grants last between two and 12 months to go abroad to do a variety of things, um, to teach, to do research, to collaborate, to lecture, to do seminars or workshops. Um, and the criteria you'll first read is about a terminal degree, right? Um, but there's a very specific caveat for artists, and I want to make sure you all are aware of that, that's recognized professional standing and substantial professional accomplishment is what we are looking for um, when people are applying to this to this program um, the uh, you can tell on our on our website here there is a um, very extensive lists of grants that are awarded in the catalog of award and one of the search terms here is the arts so you can go to the website and immediately pull up by country what countries are looking for artists to come and join their, their roster of, of scholars. So that's a, a good thing to be aware of. Um, the second type of, of grant that I want to highlight here um, is, and we have some in the room, thank you, uh, is the, oops, nope is the specialist grant. The way the specialist grant works for, for artists and for anybody is that you apply with a set of skills or expertise that you bring, um, and then you are put on the specialist roster for up to five years. Then foreign institutions can apply um, to have you come for anywhere between two and six weeks uh, to get lead workshops, do classes, master classes, think about assessment and implementation, um, and really kind of develop that, that 
cultural exchange piece of it. Um, Fulbright cares very deeply about the quality of the work being done on the program, but an explicit component of the program is also a cultural ambassador component. Um, we are interested in that exchange of ideas and, and uh, what, what then you will also be, what you'll be able to add to your community there and, and what you're, you'll be able to bring back, excuse me. Um, Thinking very, very quickly, um, the last thing I want to point out in my 30 seconds, um, for arts organizations in the US, um, we have a program called the the Outreach Lecture Fund. Um, so out of the close to 5,000 uh, foreign scholars and artists who are in the US, uh, the CIES will pay for them to travel, to do uh, seminars, outreach, master classes um, at institutions, but also at organizations. So an entire list of scholars who are currently, foreign scholars who are currently in the US is available on the webpage, and you can apply for funding to have them come and present at your organization. Um, that was the tip of the iceberg on Fulbright, but again, Fulbright is for artists. Please help us spread the word. We are looking uh, for more artists to apply to the program. Uh, we currently are not meeting the country demands that the, the countries are asking for us to send them more artists. So please send us more artists. Thank you so much. Wonderful. That's uh, one of the more encouraging news. Thank you, um, uh, uh, Laura, for, for joining us. And now I would like to introduce Nan Van Hood, the Secretary General of ITM, the International Network for Contemporary Performing Arts. Thank you. Sorry. You just move forward yeah. by pressing that. Okay. Okay, to keep us, uh, uh, thank you first uh, for having me here, and to keep us awake, I will show you some, pic some pictures and some text, but they are not related to the speech, so don't read them <laughs> while I'm speaking, but you can, f you can look them up at, uh, at our website, itm.org. Uh, they are the recommendations that are uh, written down during a brainstorm in our, one of our last meetings in Sofia, Bulgaria, on uh, international exchange in the context of um, uh, economic inequality, which is a hot topic at this moment within our network. I will talk about cultural mobility in Europe based on the uh, life sp lifespan of ITM, which started in 1981 as an international network. Uh, let's imagine it's 1981. International exchange is in the hands of the ministries of foreign affairs embassies and national institutes. Cultural mobility is boxed in foreign policy, window dressing, national pride. Some known figures in the international performing arts, festival and theater directors, theoreticians and others, decide to start something new. The new had to be anti-institutional, so they called it a meeting, IETM, uh, informal European theater meeting one of the first international cultural networks in Europe. Divided Europe. For the founders, based on both sides of the wall, enhancing mobility between East and West is one of their targets. Solidarity is an, one of their core values. Let's imagine it's 2005. After years of economic growth, flourishing contemporary arts production and increasing audience numbers, ITM has grown into the international network for the contemporary performing arts, as it is known now. Its 550 members live for 80% in Europe, the rest in all parts of the world. Europe has grown into a fortress, so Africa and the Arab world are underrepresented due to the visa problems, as we have heard of before. They never arrive in time to visit a meeting. Notwithstanding the digitalization of the most social encounters, meeting life is still at the core of ITM. Two plenaries a year with a large plate of sessions on burning issues, new developments and opportunities. Main, ob main objective for the participants to connect, to start a transborder relation, to end up in transborder collaboration. Minimum, a residency, a tour, maximum, a long-lasting collaboration. 
or an EU-funded project, or both combined. Europe is dwarfing. dwarfing. National funds and ministries like worldwide connections, and especially with the emerging economies. We match public and private EU funding, national, regional, or local fundings with the private Ford Foundation, Spins Klaus Funds, HIVOS, and others. Let's imagine, let's imagine we live in 2015. P2P networking is hot. As an alternative to the neoliberalist greed, sharing is the new dogma. There's less and less to divide. Subsidies are cut. Cultural diplomacy is dead. Private funds have suffered giant losses on their investments. Contemporary arts and independent artists realize that they can't do without mobility for breathing, but also for the breath, collecting, co-producing, combining a serial of six different studios in six different countries to create and rehearse a new production in the new reality. EU cultural policy shifts from subsidizing networking as such to enhancing artist mobility as a tool for employment and capacity building. New low budget ways of international internationalization flourish. Residencies and restaging instead of shipping productions. Touring instead of one night stands. Couch surfing and house swapping instead of hotel rooms. ITM sticks to or even improves its solidarity as a fundament. By very democ de democratic membership fee categories and also admits freelancers now. By travel grants for members with a low annual turnover and by organizing at least one meeting a year in a low-cost host country or a country where artists are under political pressure. And by building facilities to compensate when traveling is impossible, by live streaming, by online documentation, reports of meetings, research and call, calls for partners and offers for funding on its digital platform that will be built in during the uh, oncoming year. So please um, check our website and keep updated, ietm.org. Um, now we come um, to our uh, last uh, speaker, and it looks like we solved the technical problems for Yumi. We apologize again for the um, complications. After this speaker, we're going to have a very short uh, session about the workshops, where, to, where we go where, and then we will have lunch. But this is a uh, speaker, and again, uh, Yumi, we would like to say a real thank you to the support uh, towards the hospitality and towards the conference. This is all uh, because of you, so thank you. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, finally, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry for the technical problem. Yes, I uh, I will finish. I will shortly finish the presentation about the comms. As I already yeah told about before, it is uh, founded in 2006. Uh, especially, comms concentrates on provision of supports and services related to international exchange and on enhancement of the competitiveness of the Korean performing arts. Yeah, I pass all of that. I will shortly introduce about our three main uh, projects. The first one is PAMS. PAMS is a performing arts market in Seoul. Yeah, it's an international platform for encountering various kinds of Korean performing arts. Performing arts is put Pro from all over the world together to share ideas, experiences, and information for creative cooperation. Yeah, 
Uh, PAMSA is uh, held every October of the year, and the last year, 2014, well, we had its 10th uh, anniversary as well. And for, especially for the cultural mobility, we have uh, two important uh, programs. The first one is the Center Stage Korea. Center Stage Korea is a grant program. It's a grant to develop international market and audience for Korean contemporary performing arts. What it is interesting and important, you can apply for uh, to have this uh, uh, grant of a uh, grant uh, center stage Korea, you can apply as an um, international uh, presenter or um, as a member of an institution. And the second one is uh, comes connection. Yeah, comes connection is a program support which supports from research to the project development to create a system of long term and mutual cooperation with the Korean and international performing arts professionals. So, for example, we had uh, uh, Korea Finland connection with the Dancing for Finland, uh, and Korea Australia connection with Austria Council for the Arts, and Korea France connection with the Institut Français et Onda. Yeah, so we have uh, lots of other comms connection program as well. If you have, uh, um, if you would like to have more information about uh, Comms work, Comms project, and uh, inf more information about Korean art scene, yeah, so you can visit the website DA Pro and DR Pro. The first one, DA Pro, is a web platform for performing arts, and the second one, the DR Pro, is. Uh, uh, website for contemporary visual arts. In fact, it comes founded with uh, uh, mission for especially for performing arts, but now we will just launch the uh, project in visual arts as well. Yeah, it's a sum up of our uh, project. Yeah, from this level to touring level, we have uh, various uh, programs. Yeah, our partners. Thank you. And <laughs> yeah, I'll let you go free uh, yeah, to have uh, a lunch. And if we have more information, yeah, don't hesitate to yeah, come to me. Thank you. Hello, it's us again. Before, uh, <laughs> before we release you for your lunch, uh, we want to tell you a little bit about what's going to happen this afternoon, which is a slightly different format. Uh, as we move into uh, deeper discussions on particular topics that relate to uh, international exchange and collaboration. So our idea for this afternoon is that you will select one of the seven group offerings that you can see listed in your program. They're all described in a paragraph in your program. And um, most of the rooms that they take place in are right out here, outside across the, the lobby. Um, but there are two rooms that are on the third floor for two of the meetings. So there'll be volunteers to help you find those rooms if you decide that you're in that group. The idea for each of these conversations, as there'll be 90-minute sessions, is that we get as deeply as possible into a conversation about these, each of these particular issues with the goal toward looking for recommendations, solutions, and ideas. It's not going to be a session where you come in and just talk about what your organization does. It's going to be a working session where you actually work with your colleagues to find the common uh, resources, ideas, and recommendations that then we will all bring back when we come together. So one representative from each of the seven discussion groups will make a presentation to the full group after the coffee break in the afternoon. So we'll come back here and we'll talk about what went on in each of those groups. So um, Roberta is going to again go over what the seven are and we'd like to know from you uh, as much as possible as you could know at this point, how many people might be in each of the groups? I mean, we have the rooms basically hold about 30 people, but the people who are in the biggest group, which we assume will be the funding group, uh, will be meeting in this space, so that could be an unlimited number of people. So, but, uh, Roberta? 
So uh, here are the groups. They're in your programs. The definitions of the groups are in the program. I'm going to read the seven names, and then I'm going to ask for a show of hands just what you think you might be interested in. It's only so that we know roughly how many people. You're not obligated by this show of hands. So the seven working groups. The first one is socially engaged performance. And that's going to be right across the lobby in C201. You'll see a sign on the door, socially engaged performance. The description is, is in the program. The second one is a working group. Oh, OK. I was going to read all five and then, OK. Yeah, read it first so you know what they are. OK, uh, the second one is artists and human rights artists and human rights. And that is going to be across the lobby in C202. You'll see a sign on the door. The third one, should be lively today, is visa taxes and practical challenges. That's in C203, also right across the lobby. The fourth one is funding practices in the United States and other countries. A lot of what we were beginning to learn about this morning. And that is going to be here in the Prashansky, if indeed we have the largest number of hands for funding practices. Number five is practitioners experience sharing. And that's in C204, right across the lobby. The sixth is international collaborations in hybrid forms, something that Johan Flok was talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, and that will be on the third floor. And you will be able to ask one of our many volunteers, how do I get to the third floor and can you guide me? And the seventh one is a very interesting one, which we thank the National Performance Network for offering to us. And that is climate action and cultural collaboration. And that will also be on the seventh floor. So before you get your shortened but one hour lunch break, um, how many people are interested in socially engaged performance? Show of hands. OK, okay. somebody's noted. Um, number two is artists and human rights. Okay. Great. Number three, visas, taxes, practical challenges. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, funding practices in the US and other countries. Yeah, right here. <laughs> Um, number five, practitioners experience sharing. Great. And number six, international collaborations in hybrid forms. Ooh, wow. Big okay, group. big group. That's good to know. And number seven, climate action and cultural collaboration. Excellent. Small but mighty. Small but mighty. Um, so uh, we are going to take into consideration what we just saw. Sandwiches are available free to you in the lobby outside. Uh, if you'd like to, I believe there's a cafe downstairs. Um, and uh, please be back in an hour. Go directly to your session, the session you choose, at 2.30. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody. Thank you.